Val, it's so good to see you again. It is. I'm having a conversation with Val Williams, a really amazing woman who is not only one of the leading executive coaches in the country, but she's also a very, very accomplished author and a very big human being that's deeply engaged in questions that we share around who people are, how we relate to life, how we relate to the future. And so we're going to have a few, uh, an exploration, really, of what you see, Val. Well, in my travels, so I work with senior executives and their teams, uh, usually in large corporate companies. And it's interesting that there is a lot going on in the world. But when my clients talk to me, what they talk to me about is they have a concern about what's going on in the world. And they're, they're, they come to me to say they're feeling restless about what's happening. So these are successful people. I, I, I'm inspired by some of the people that I work with. So senior executives at large companies who are doing big things. And they're successful already. So this is not a matter of um, a lack of confidence about what to do in the world. But they want to have a greater impact. And so what they talk about is they're feeling restless to want to do more, right, to do something about what's happening in the world. They also notice that, amazingly, at the senior levels, it's actually sometimes harder to have the impact, even though presumably you have more, more autonomy and more power, it's harder. Um, but I think the biggest thing is that maybe because of the way the world is now, uh, a lot of executives say that they're not feeling as alive as they once did. They're not as excited about their work as they once were, and so, there's that wish to, I want to have an impact that's bigger and an impact that's more meaningful, but I want to feel alive. Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, I can relate to that in my own life because, I, I, in fact, this is something that's just happened, I don't know, in the last maybe six months, uh, where I realize that almost my entire life has been organized around accomplishment yes. and, a good piece, and a good portion of that around wanting to make a difference. Yes. And yes. Uh, somehow it dawned on me that there wasn't enough I could accomplish or not enough difference that I could make. Plus, there was probably a lot of ego in even imagining that I might make a difference. Yes. Uh, that I somehow realize that there's a whole set of other questions and other attitudes and other ways of, of relating to life mm -hmm. than just uh, trying to uh, score another goal or to accomplish another uh, result or to build another enterprise. Exactly. Okay, so that's my clients and I, this is exactly what we found. Because that same uh, restlessness that they were feeling, I was feeling too, like you're talking about it. I felt it too as an entrepreneur. And so we, we started to look at, okay, if we're going to have large scale impact, because uh, most senior executives now, many have global companies, right? So they're looking to have impact all over the world. So we said, okay, so to have that kind of an impact, what should we be doing? And at first, you know, the place that we look, like you're talking about, you look to the world of achievement and accomplishment, like, well, then let's get a bigger strategy and let's get a big vision and let's, uh, let's ramp up performance. Um, and so we thought we were looking for a new strategy. And the most surprising thing that I learned, similar to what you're saying, is that we weren't looking for a new strategy. To have the kind of impact that I think people want to have now, it's a new identity. you got to become someone different. And so the biggest thing that I've experienced and my clients have is shifting from the identity of high achiever, like always wanting to do something, to now what I would call the artist. That's very, very interesting. Something. You know, I, I've got this theme that we've been building into lots of these uh, uh, Possible Futures videos. Uh, and one of the themes that I'm, I'm into is the, the phenomenon of accelerating change, of increasing complexity, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. lack of control, yes, and yes. unpredictability. Yeah. And I sort of boil all that together into something I'm calling a real-time world. Oh, okay. But when I think about a real-time world, the, the image that I get or the analogy I get is it's surfing. Ah. That, that, we kinda, that, that the future is emerging like a wave and, mm -hmm. and the past is disappearing. Uh, as fast, and, and the thing that's unusual, I think it may have always been that way, but the thing that's unusual is that this is happening in one lifetime. Mm. In some cases, less than a lifetime. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so it's it's the speed at which it's happening that's yes. beginning to to maybe produce some of that restlessness. Mm -hmm. But when I when I was looking at what do people need to learn mm -hmm. in order to be effective mm -hmm. in navigating in that world? So mm -hmm. you, again, using the surfing metaphor, what do what competencies do I need to develop? Mm -hmm. And this is where the analogy probably breaks down. But one of those uh, what one of those competencies is the ability to accept. Yeah. To, 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 to let life happen without mm -hmm. trying to understand why it happened. Yes. And yes. to be present yeah. in, a, in a very particular way. But mm -hmm. the second one relates to this thing about new identity, which is, I call it, innovating oneself. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, we talk about innovation in the world, we talk about innovation in, in uh, products and so forth, but yes. we don't talk about when's the last time you innovated you. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so that's just what we're finding. So when we when we look at this shift from, I'm just gonna, for lack of a better word, I'm gonna call it the shift from high achiever to being more of an artist, to being more creative. Because mm -hmm. the when you talk about what kind of capability do we need, so as a high achiever, you know, it's about skill, it's about accomplishment, it's pretty intellectual. And I think the big surprise to me was that I thought I could play the high achiever game forever. I thought that game would continue to go on. It never occurred to me that there would be a broader identity. So the identity I'm calling artist, I think would be similar to your now, surfer. Are you, are you using identity sort of synonymous with way of being? Yes, same, way of yeah. being, or right? Or ground of being, context, where you yes. come from. where so you come sort of, from. So, yeah. so here's, here's what I would say. So a high achiever, as I am a recovering high achiever now, right? Mm -hmm. A high achiever comes from accomplishment, achievement, and as you said, ego to some degree. I don't think that's bad, right? Whereas an artist, I have learned through my clients, is about connection. So I like your surfing analogy because if you're going to surf well, you've got to be connected to yourself, you've got to be connected to the wave, you've got to be connected to energy. And you have to be open to the intersection of waves yeah. and, and surprises exactly. that you don't have any control over. But when it happens, it changes the whole, the the whole, whole thing, the, right. the whole dynamic. You know, I wrote an article once called Managers Anonymous. And I was saying, you know, you can be addicted to a worldview or a mindset or a paradigm, pretty much like you could be addicted to a substance or mm -hmm. behavior or something yeah, like that. Yeah. And so I, I reflected on the world of management, mm -hmm. and by extension in this conversation, accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And it was really all about control and prediction. Yes. And yes. that we mostly have a culture of management mm -hmm. uh, that's addicted to the concept of control and prediction. Totally agree. And if you totally begin to agree. chip away at that and mm -hmm. begin to question whether that's really the point, mm -hmm. never mind whether you can even do it. Yeah. Most people, I think, would agree today, you may not have so much control if you ever did. Right. And you sure as heck can't trust your predictions. Right. If can't, you ever could. Can't predict. So and, so if you take those two things away and you're mm -hmm. left with what it, what have you got, you've got a recovering manager. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, like I, I jokingly I like said we should have a 12-step program for managers. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was going to call it Mananon and we'd have little centers and all the, like different, the different corporations. But, but the part <laughs> that I didn't see until this conversation is that, is that part of recovering from that worldview or that yeah. that way of seeing the world also means you have to be able to uh, create who create. you are, create right. yourself. That's, that's why I call it being an artist, right? So to me, being an artist is actually an enlargement of who you are as how, how do you get, How do you get people to, to make that shift or make that move? To be an artist? Well, just from one way of being to another. I think it's practice, or, or maybe let me go back, because I'll, I'll look at my own experience, what got me there. Um, it's an appreciation of the limits of the high achiever identity, or the high achiever game, right? So like I said, I thought it would never end. I thought like, okay, I'll just, you know, I'm a successful person, my clients are successful people, we'll just have bigger goals. And as achievers, we'll just keep achieving. But what I actually saw, the, and, and this took me back, is that the high achiever game is actually a limited game. It's actually kind of a small game because when you're a high achiever, you have to be really focused on goals. You, it sometimes brings tunnel vision. Uh, you can become one-dimensional, successful, doing, doing a lot of great stuff. Um, but I think my clients well, and, and it's I... All, but it's also true, I think, that, that achievement is never a fact. It's always relative to some it's point of view. It's an assessment, right? So what's a great achievement to somebody else might be sacrificing exactly. your family and your, yeah. your kids. Well, you know, in my own life, part of this, this transition that you're pointing at, I think, 
uh, my own coach was talking to me about it, at my age of 74, it's time to begin to perhaps stop playing the accomplishment game. Yes, yeah. And maybe start yeah. playing uh, the wisdom game or the what life is yeah. about game. Yeah, uh, You know, and, and uh, shift my relationship to myself yes. and my relationship to other people. I, I agree because that, and that's why I call it like the art of beneficial impact because my clients and I are all about impact, but we'd like it to be beneficial. And I think it's an art more than a science because think of an artist versus the high achiever paradigm. An artist, everything's about connection. Mm -hmm. And so what I've learned now is that, you know, at one point when you say, well, how do you help people make the shift? I've made a suggestion, and again, learning it right through the executives I work with, the ones that do it best are connected to a few things. So they're going for a much deeper connection to themselves. That would be the first area. And you and I talked about this a few years ago, right? So if you're gonna be more connected to yourself and be more artistic and creative and design more of who you are, you, you gotta have your self-sufficiency and self-worth handled. And that's what I learned from our last conversations, mm -hmm. right? Because you, if you're still looking for approval or looking for validation, that actually gets in the way of having a big impact in the world. Well, and that's also driven by this larger uh, cultural common sense about mm -hmm. you know people are things, mm -hmm. and you have to you have to shore up. You you got to be you know good looking and intelligent and yeah. have all the right pieces and the right check the right boxes in order to accomplish. Yeah. And when you really challenge that and say you know there really are no preconditions no, to no. living and there's no preconditions, but and it also resonates with the, with this notion that I have of, of leadership is primarily about creating reality. Mm, I like that. Uh, yeah, you know, declaring. The, the theme of this is possible futures, mm -hmm. and I think uh, one of the big ahas I had one day was that. Uh, most people think that possibilities exist in mm -hmm. reality, mm -hmm. and then they debate whether they think something is possible or not. Mm -hmm. And they usually uh, the light goes on when I point to them. You know, if you think about it, the word possibility means not real. Yeah. If cool. it was real, it would be an example. Yeah. So possibilities are inherently created. Okay. All right. And th and then I say to myself, perhaps the key to this transformation of identity or mm -hmm. this transformation mm -hmm. of who you are or this transformation of your relationship to all of it is in being able to commit to a possibility mm -hmm. before there's yes. any evidence that yes. it's possible. Okay, I'm with you on that, yeah. right? So, Val, I guess the way I see that is it's kind of like we li we're always living in two realities. The reality of the past, which is you know, leads to a predictable future, mm -hmm. and then the reality of the possible, which we have to invent. Yes. Yeah. And yes. that, that, that I, you know, I, I love the idea of creating reality. Yes. So many, so many people, uh, I ask them, I say, you know, do your commitments create your reality? Uh -huh. Or does your view of reality inform what you commit to? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So we're on the same page because yeah. that's why I call it an art, right? Yeah. So I, I think if you're going to have large scale impact as a senior executive, I think you're like a sculptor. Mm -hmm. So to your point, it's like taking a block of marble, which is nothing and trying to shape it and mold it and turn it into something. That's what senior executives have to do. Yes. And so what I think what we're learning, because I'm learning uh, with them, is that, like you say, if you're going to declare a possibility, then when you're working with other people, connecting with other people, um, especially as a senior leader, you're trying to, uh, if you put it in a sales paradigm, you're trying to sell them something they don't yet know they need. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's a it's a in order to have impact, it's a different way of being, right? Because now it's like you're trying to show them a future that you see that nobody else sees, and I think sometimes what happens is we fold too early. Mm. It's like we you know we go out there and we say I've got this great idea, and people are like no, and we're like they don't get it. They don't well, that's right. It. I mean, they, you see a possibility or you've created a possibility mm -hmm. and they don't. And it's kind of like trying to teach uh, uh, people in a black and white world what color is. Exactly. And, and it's, uh, it's very interesting. Let, let me shift the conversation a little bit to, to what do you think's going on that has this restlessness be so pervasive? Yeah. So, I mean, have, have, have senior people always had that restlessness or is there something happening that's yeah. provoking or aggravating that or... or uh, I, you know, I've been thinking about that. I think 
I think there's there's two sides to it. I think the external side is that you look at the world and the world needs some help. And you know, I always like to think of it as the world's in breakdown, but it's not beyond repair, mm -hmm. right? So I'm hopeful. So I think senior executives look at the world and say, there's a lot that needs to be done. So I think part of the restlessness is from that. Um, but maybe because I focus on the personal side of leadership, I think the other part of the restlessness is that hole in the soul, that when you don't feel alive because people are so busy, meeting after meeting, electronic after electronic thing, yeah. that I think people want something more. And so they, they're expressing it as, I wanna have more impact, but I think what executives are really saying is, I wanna do something that means more to me. And to your point about that it's not the predictable future, it's something where I don't know what's gonna happen, where I can feel on the edge, and then I feel alive. I want that too. So I think that restlessness is, you know, how can I do something new where I feel alive like I did when I first started my career? Yeah, you know, that aliveness feeling or that, that, that quality of, of living that uh, uh, is, is authentic and, and it pulls for the kind of passionate uh, yeah. engagement yeah. you know that we're talking about it seems to me that that uh, a lot of that is available when you have time mm. to reflect and mm -hmm. a lot of the pressure on time as you say whether it's digital technology or meetings or yeah. go 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 yes. or increased productivity or whatever it may be uh, has sort of robbed us of the 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 luxury of reflection yes yes you know, that and, yeah that's why to me that's why it's connection right so it's connection with oneself whether that's like being on the treadmill and thinking while you're there or being out in nature, meditating, whatever. But I find a lot of executives don't have time for that. So sometimes, even when I'm coaching a pretty high level person, the answer to having impact is start taking better care of yourself. Well, Slow I, down. Absolutely. Well, you know, there's two other things that I'm noticing in my own journey. One is, one is a, a, a incredible appreciation for the mystery Mm. of living and mm -hmm. life in the universe. I mean, uh, I don't know that I ever thought much about it in my career, and yeah. I certainly am not trying to figure it out. It's more like I'm able to be kind of at peace, I guess, with uh -huh. the idea that whatever all of this is that produced this stuff called life on this little planet out of however many billions of planets and stars there are in the universe, mm -hmm. you know, is certainly beyond my comprehension, and mm -hmm. I'm pretty confident beyond our collective comprehension. Yeah. Yet, yeah. at the same time, I think most of our growing up time has been to either try to figure it out or ignore that kind of idea, you yeah. know, or try to relegate it to some kind of spiritual, religious, metaphysical world. Yeah. But, but really, I think that the, the mystery is very palpable. And yeah. it not only pulls for a kind of humility and mm -hmm. a kind of healthy relationship with ego, but mm -hmm. it also allows one to have a certain amount of serenity and a certain yeah. amount of, of acceptance of whatever it might be. Yeah. And the other side is that is this just profound sense of gratitude mm -hmm. for the for the privilege of being alive. Yeah. And, and in just the blink of an eye, uh, we're here, uh, like a raindrop falling from the cloud to the ocean, and we have that that time in between, whatever that may be. Okay, but now this brings up a question, then, right? Especially when you talk about the mystery. So here's what I'm wrestling with. But how do you? So I agree with you. But how? When talking to a senior executive who says, but, you know, I have a P&L to meet, I have, you know, stockholders, I, I have all these practical concerns, how do we help an executive know that relaxing into that mystery and gratitude is, is relevant, it's going to be helpful? It's like sometimes I feel the need to help, we, we got to help each other connect the dots. When, when I talk to those people, uh, I sometimes use a model that my daughter-in-law invented. I think she invented it, or she found it. At least I heard it from her. It's called the stay model. Okay. You stop thinking it's about you. Oh, I like that. That's so, good. So I try to show those same senior executives that, it, that, that you need to be able to truly walk the talk in mm -hmm. terms of trusting your team. Yeah. You know, I hear a lot of executives say, you know, it's all about team and all about my people and so forth, but then they're right on top of it in terms of, trying to either mm -hmm. fix people or control people right. or, or produce policies that one way or another move people. It's, yeah. it's all this mindset of trying to fix reality. 
Right, and they to, won't let it unfold. We're trying to fix people. Yeah, I say, look, people don't need to be fixed. Yeah. You know, they need to have the a freedom to choose. Mm -hmm. They need to have an opening in which they, they can be authentic and express yeah. whatever's real for them. And if you're willing to trust that yeah. and try to break this addiction to control. Okay, that's good. I, I, li I like that. that. You know, that is good, right? Yeah. Because that that's the challenge, because executives have so many practical concerns. Um, so again, th this is helpful because I'm like, okay, so it still goes back to connection and. Well, also, also, I think we what I think I'm hearing what you're saying is the idea of beneficial impact is not about quantity of activity or no. anything. It's about a relationship. Right. So in that sense, what's to make you think you don't already have a beneficial impact? Yeah. And, well. And what and what makes you think what makes you yearn for something more? Well, see, I would say, for some executives, if that connection is not deep enough to oneself then to your point, then you're still striving. You are always wanting more. You're never letting yourself have it. So when I say that connection to self is important, that's what I really mean. Like you have to, you have to get to the point where you can declare like, okay, I'm, I'm good. And you have, to, you have to be able to validate your value without looking at your scorecard. Exactly, yeah. so that's, okay, so that goes back to conversations that we've had in the past about your self-worth is a different conversation than what you decide to achieve. Exactly. And I think if you're gonna have impact, you really gotta have those two conversations handled. So yeah. there was a time as a high achiever when I felt like, well, of course I'm worthy because look at all I'm doing. Whereas now I think like, okay, that's a way to help people make that identity shift to realize like those are two separate things. Cause some, and sometimes when I talk to executives about that, they're like, really? No, no, they're, they're together. I'm like, actually, look at it. They can be pulled apart. That's beautiful. Well, it's exciting to talk to you. I, I'll, sh I'll end it with sort of one little quick uh, anecdote. Uh, I was talking to my wife the other day, and we were talking about the future and something, and I said, you know, honey, I only really have 20 years. And uh, I've said things like that, and I've had healthy conversations about death and mortality and age yeah. and so forth for a long time. But something in this conversation this particular conversation hit me so in bodily. I mean, it was like this visceral experience. Holy cow, this is the truth. Oh. I mean, I may be 25 or who knows, but yeah. but the yeah. point here yeah. is it, it, in 20 years, I'll be 94, okay? And then I'm gonna be for, theoretically over, you know, that's, and I realize there's a difference between living with concepts, yes. okay, yeah. about age or dying yeah. or, or time or whatever you may have, and actually seeing the horizon seeing the finish line and being able to really take pause and step back and I was able to uh, the good news is 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 with that bodily experience validate that there's nothing missing in my life oh, and I'm cool. absolutely complete there's nothing I want and nothing's missing and in that sense I'm very happy to live however life unfolds for the next 20 years but more importantly I realized that the more one can accept the mm -hmm. finitude of living, yes. the more alive one can be in the present. Oh, totally. And, agree. and totally it's agree. been so rich yeah. since then. I mean, it's always been rich, but it's even even richer yeah. to, 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 and maybe that's where this sense of gratitude is, is emerging from. But one way or the other, I think you and I are, are very much uh, aligned in our appreciation yes, for definitely. the fact that leaders create reality mm -hmm. and that reality they're creating is intimately connected to their identity and who they are. Who they are, totally, right? That's it. And, yeah. So nice of you to come. I really appreciate oh, this is fun. your time and I hope we can have another conversation soon. I'm ready for another one. All right. Thank you, Val. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.